Ask Me Anything. We've got a great lineup of speakers for you today, and they are here to answer all of your burning questions about SaaS and growth and funding and sales and pretty much anything else. Um, a few housekeeping items for us to cover before we get started. Um, go ahead and tweet your questions using the hashtag SASTERAMA. Uh, that's right below me there. Uh, and the video for this will be available right after the webcast. And don't forget to buy your tickets to the SASTER annual. Prices go up July 1st. Uh, and thank you to our sponsor, Lighter Capital. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the CEO of Lighter Capital to tell you a little bit more and then to introduce our other speakers today. Please join me in welcoming BJ Lackland. Thanks, Gretchen. And listen, we're really happy to be involved in this and um, putting this on today. We think it would be really helpful. Um, I know a lot of uh, the companies that we fund love to read the Sasser blog and, and like Aaron's uh, book on uh, predictable revenue as well. So. Really happy to be involved in this and hope it educates a lot of people. Um, so let me give you a quick background on, on Aaron and Jason and myself. Um, Aaron was, uh, is the author of Predictable Revenue, um, a book that's all about building up your, your MRR, your, your ACV and such. To It's a number one best-selling book on Amazon, I believe, in the telemarketing category. And it's overall a great read for companies trying to figure out how to put together your sales organization. Um, Aaron consults to a lot of businesses doing these types of things and is, is really a good proponent for a sort of a new era of outbound calling. We'll get some into that later, I think. We've got a lot of questions about that. Uh, Jason Lemkin. Jason's uh, both the author of the Saster blog that I think a lot of people read, as well as a managing director at Storm Ventures and a former entrepreneur who's built up and sold uh, two successful SaaS businesses and uh, does a great job of sharing his his lessons and such on the Saster blog that I know uh, a lot of the companies that we fund read um, quite religiously, frankly, um, and it's great help, particularly in, in, again, how to organize their sales and things like that. Um, so I'm BJ Lackland, and I'm the CEO of Letter Capital. Uh, my background, actually, I was a, a venture capitalist before at a group called Summit Energy Ventures, and uh, been at Letter Capital for three years, and a little bit about us. We focus on funding, frankly, a lot of SaaS businesses. At this point in time, I think we've funded over 30 SaaS businesses. Um, we fund them a little different way. We're not a venture capitalist. We don't take equity. We take what we call a revenue-based loan. But essentially, we take a royalty uh, on the business, and it works really well for a lot of nascent SaaS businesses. Um, anyway, with that, why don't we head into some of the different questions. So it seems like the questions we fielded them kind of broke into two different categories, one around sort of financial type matters and raising money, and the other one, uh, more around sales and sales organizations and things like that, that I think uh, is where a lot of the companies that we talk to um, find a lot of the, the writings that Aaron and, and Jason do to be extremely helpful. Um, so why don't we start with some that we, that we actually got off of Twitter and such. Um, the first one is uh, from Poya at, at, at Hacker Rank. Um, what are some of the fundamental sales practices that are really crucial to a sales rep as they go through their, their experience? And, and obviously, let's particularly focus this on, on SaaS and predictable, predictable revenue types of companies. But as they sort of go through their career, what do you see as the evolution frequently? And uh, Aaron or Jason, whoever wants to jump in on that one, go for it. Yeah, I, I got one. I got something. And I'm actually going to speak more towards the... Because someone asked me a question like this, it's sort of, uh, what's something that really helps differentiate a sales rep or salesperson? I was like, well, there's lots of techniques, but you know, one thing I've really found to be uh, incredibly helpful to making anyone successful who's selling, whether you're a CEO or a salesperson, is having been in lots of sales cycles where you've seen when it works well and when it doesn't. And what happens is then you build up that confidence to know when you're talking to a great prospect who's hesitating. You can you have that confidence to say you need to buy it for these reasons. Like basically get off you know get off your ass and do this. And if it's not a fit, you have the confidence to say you know what you probably shouldn't do this with us. You might need to look at a competitor or not do this at all. But it puts you in the position of having an expertise to to give them truly useful advice for themselves, which sometimes should include them buying your product and using it the right way. Well, so asking for the PO, right? A lot of salespeople are salespeople, but they forget to ask for the PO. Yeah, it helps take away some of the uh, the nervousness, anxiety, and uh, fear of um, are the are they uh, say it's are they not going to like me because I'm 
you know, there's a lot of, uh, so even in sales, a lot of people have uh, like a fear of rejection. Yeah. Yeah. Let me add, I think it's good. Let me add uh, a thought onto the question if I'm understanding it right. Even if I'm not, we'll have some fun answering a, a repurposed version of the question. Um, a version of that question is if I'm a sales rep, what's my career path, right? How do I get to the next level? And I'll tell you one thing I've learned a lot over the last 18 months, and let me give you the one bit of advice to aggressive sales reps that want to get to the next level. There's really two career paths for a sales rep, right? You can be an individual contributor forever and make millions of dollars, right? Then the typical career path is go more enterprise, right, Aaron? <laughs> so yeah. Learn how to sell bigger deals, and once you start selling million-dollar deals, you can start taking on million-dollar commission checks. Uh, it takes a while. So decide if you want to be on the IC track or the manager track. And figure that out. Look inside yourself, because VP of sales sounds glamorous, but it's a very different job than an IC. And let's talk about that. And know, your, know yourself. Know yourself. And there are folks in the... The classic analogy is, is is blackjack dealers. I don't gamble. I don't do Vegas. But as I understand it, you can if you if you do the big stakes tables in Vegas, you can make a lot more money in tips than the guy that ever manages you, right? Yeah. And and the same can be true for cash and sales, right? A, a, the greatest rep can make more for a long time than the VP of sales, but the VP of sales can get one percent of the company, right? So what what's your play? And so first, figure that out, and then, and then I say, if you really want to be a VP of sales, here's the number one mistake I see reps make, number one mistake. I'm at Hank Packer Rank, which is a great company, like our, our, our question, questionnaire asked, or I'm at wherever, some great company, and, and I've never actually been a manager. I've never hired any reps. I've never led any reps, but I've killed my number, and some hot but green startup hires me as the VP of sales. You will fail. You will fail 90, not 100%, 95 times out of 100, because the number one job for a VP of sales, as Aaron and I have both written on different ways, is recruiting a team. And in sales, if you've never recruited anybody, you will fail quickly, at least in a high growth environment. If you're in a slow growth environment, you may be able to stub your toe, but if you go to somewhere hot, you will die. So my number one bit of advice is, one, figure out which track you're on, I see your manager, and two, don't make the jump to VP until you're ready. You've got to be at least a team manager or a director or something, and you've got to report to a great one. And the greatest VPs of sales and SaaS, if you look out there, they all reported to someone great, at least for a year, and built at least a very small team under them, and then went on to the next best thing. Um, Recruiting is like such a different skill, and building a sales team is like such a different skill than actually selling itself. I mean, you're, you're selling when you're trying to recruit somebody, obviously. It's a totally different process yes. um, that people do. I totally agree. And um, so many great sales reps who kill the top 10%, and they go out and they skip the steps, and six months later they're out of a VP of sales job. It wasn't worth it. Like, you can't, I don't believe you can skip, you can skip a bunch of steps. But I think it takes you about five to six years to become a VP of sales, best case. You go from SDR to SMB rep to enterprise rep to team lead to director of sales to VP. If you accelerate everything and you work at a Zenefits or a talk desk or a Slack, maybe not the Slack has sales reps, a Zenefits or a talk desk, maybe you can go from SDR to VP in six years, right? But faster than that, I don't think, Aaron, I don't know if you disagree, I don't think it's possible. To be, I would say, a real VP of sales. A real VP, right? Not a Salesforce, B, you know, SVP today, but a real VP for a fast-growing <laughs> sales company, right? You've got to hire three reps, and you've got to close the load of deals, and you've got to right. save, save them from, from, and you've got to know what the difference between outbound and inbound is. You have to have done both, right? And you just can't, there's only so many hours in the air you can skip to be a pilot. <laughs> Hey, that brings up, I think, a good related point, and it's a, it's a blog post I know of yours, Jason, on hiring a VP of sales. Like, you talk a lot about that, and I know it's one that a lot of the companies that we fund um, look at a lot. If, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see in hiring a VP of sales? I mean, you talk a lot about sort of stage appropriateness and things like that, like you were mentioning Salesforce and such. Um, yeah. Maybe you can go through some of those, because it's a lot of times it's tempting to make your top salesperson your VP of sales, and that is a classic mistake. Yeah, well, we could spend the rest of our time on that. Let me throw out the one, and then Aaron, you throw out one, right? Mm -hmm. To me, the, the num that making your best guy your VP of sales is maybe around number eight. We could chat about that. That usually doesn't work out, but it's not fatal, right? If he doesn't work out, but he's a great leader, I see you just talk him in six months or three months or six days. Um, sometimes it's fatal, but I think the number one mistake is, 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 lo is logo over excessive logo affinity. Right? I, I'm going to hire someone from Box or Dropbox or Salesforce or pick your company, 
And I let everything else kind of slide. Hasn't really recruited a great team. Didn't really blow out his number. Doesn't actually understand how we sell because I just want someone from Salesforce or Box. And especially first-time founders, but really all of them, I see it again and again and again and again. Right? It's over. And what you really want better to have hired someone from Ignite and Box. It was harder to be number two. Right? You learned more. Rather than the guy that joined Box at eighty-seven million in ARR, yeah, he may be. He may not. He may be ascribing too much to that logo. So I don't know what yours is, Eric. My number one is logo and patchuration. Yeah, no, that's uh, so true. And uh, I would say, you know, actually, I'm, something you said, Jason, is so dead on. Is if you really want to be a great something, whatever that is, VP of Sales, like find a great someone, find someone to work for, because that's the fastest way to learn is to work for that person who's already an expert. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, listen, that was great, and that was only one question. So we've got tons more, um, and I'm sure we won't make it to all of them. But so be it. Yeah, and and we could go on with that topic, like you said, forever. Um, making the transition from traditional software sales to SaaS-based model. This is something we see a lot. Or we also got a bunch of questions also on making a transition from a services business to a product business or a SaaS product business. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of combining a couple of people's different questions here, so I want to identify them specifically. But basically, what are some of the common issues and problems that we all see with companies that are making that transition? Some of those are bootstrapped. You see a lot of services companies that are bootstrapped making that transition. And what we find is that that is a far more difficult transition than anybody anticipates. So hard. Yeah, and Aaron, you go, I'll give you my learning. So I just invested in a company that did it. I wrote a blog post about it called Logical. Logical bootstrap the services business and e-discovery for 10 years that was making a lot of money and then poured that all into turn into a SaaS business, right? And investing in something that's been a services business for 10 years into SaaS, that violates like every tenant of what VCs are supposed to yeah. Like that one just doesn't work, right? But they're killing it. And I'll tell you, and, and Andy wrote a great blog post people could read, but I'll tell you the number one learning from it, and I've worked with other companies that have done it, the number one learning is you got to go all in. Yeah. All in. The temptation is to go 50% in, 80% in, maintain the services business, put my buddy Linda in charge of the services while I go do the SaaS. I mean, we see that again and again, right, Aaron? And I, I don't know any of those that really kill it, right? And these guys at Logical, I mean, bless their souls, they moved, they moved the entire company from D.C. to the Bay Area to be where it is, right? They took a $4 million services business that had good margins and just put every nickel into building the SaaS business, which is a little bit irrational when you think about how much money went in their pockets. Yep. And they went all in. And it is not, from a dollar, short-term dollars and cents perspective, that made no sense with the logical, right? They sacrificed big six-figure uh, into seven-figure draws to make almost nothing, right, to build something, to build a unicorn. Um, but if you don't do it, it never works. You're always got one foot in, in the other land. And then those guys down the street, that are all in, they're going to kill you. They're going to eat you for lunch today, the ones that are all in. That seems yep. pretty interesting that they actually moved offices. Like, I wonder how much that actually helped make that break. I um, think it was important. Yeah. Yeah. you gotta, you got to change your environment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to change your mentality. Changing the environment certainly helps with that. Um, that's pretty yeah. interesting. We, I, so, yeah. oh, well. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, long, so first, Jason's right, um, duh, but... I think the other thing is that people, uh, especially on business changes, but I think it too in terms of someone learning a new skill, vastly underestimate the amount of time and energy and maybe money, but the effort. Oh yeah. So that you put they put together this like six models, and two years later they're still ironing it. You know, so working through the transition. I, I mean, I think people do this in their lives as well, but it's a, it's like and Jason had a great post that you know after a year. Of if you're starting a SaaS company, it doesn't take a year; it takes two. The principle is the same, so it just takes long. It takes as long as it takes. So, like you know, expectation around success and when it happens. Now, I will say we're turning from a services business into a SaaS business as well. Plus, we merged two companies, and we're probably violating even not only Jason's prior rules, um, but it's starting to take off really quickly. And we have a very special case with you know what we're doing. But uh, it's like when you really go for something, that's how people break rules is by really going all, all especially because that's how you get the unicorn is you do something that everyone thought was impossible or is different. 
Yeah. Um, all right. A little bit noise in the background. Is that you, Jason? That is right in your car. In our hip, 120-year-old new Petrero office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, gone. Big city. I need something that automatically turns off all alarms in San Francisco. All right, keep going. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, it, let's let's stay with the sales stuff. I think it's great. Um, we got a question, and I think it really relates to actually a lot of Aaron's writings on on predictable revenue and such. So one of the questions we got was um, sort of try to summarize here a little bit. Really, how important is it to have a customer success team, or or what uh, Aaron, a lot of your writings you call customer success slash account management, um, as distinct from uh, the actual account executives or you know SDRs and things like that, and um, and so I think the, the further add on that a lot of the companies that we fund are pretty early stage. They're looking at hiring their first VP of sales, their first two or three salespeople. You know the CEO is doing that transition away from being the salesperson into hiring some people, and and you have a great framework, uh, Aaron, your book for for how to set that up. Um, with SDRs, account execs, and account management, and then either further segmenting, um, you know, the outbound and inbound. But maybe you can talk a little bit to when it's important to do all those different pieces in the development of a business. Like, at what stages should people really be looking at developing all those different groups? Sure. Question. In fact, in the next book, uh, when Jason has this question comes up so much. But no matter what size you are, you have to have a focus on customer success. So when you're one person, you you know you're focused on it. You might block out time for it. When you're you've got two salespeople, typically one might be a prospector, one a closer, or one inbound lead response, one closer. You know the next person you hire could be customer success. It depends on how many customers you have. Are they staying? Are they going? Uh, but it's very easy for a small company, assuming you're small. Uh, with the question to get so focused on new customers that you forget about the current ones and you take them for granted and you don't really switch your attention until you start losing them and you're like I'm having five five or ten percent of well say five percent attrition per month which is more than half my customers are leaving per year I gotta fix this so I've seen companies I mean by the time they're ten or fifteen people usually have someone dedicated to customer success who can really just focus on it because if you're doing it part time, you know it's just not going to be as uh, you're not going to really nail the solution that you need to if, when you're doing it in bits and pieces. Yep. Yeah, my rule, my rule of thumb is it's a single digit and higher. Yeah, and that's a fair one. Before you get into the double digits of employees, I can't. It may vary based on who you are. It's a single digit higher. That's my rule, my simple, overly simple rule. And the, the larger learning, and I did I wrote about this in the second timer series. When you see folks that have done it again, they're hiring customer success people even before they have salespeople. Because they understand the power of word of mouth, viral referrals, upsells, resells, left sells, right sells, land and expand, expand and land. That's where the money is. 80% of the revenue in SaaS is after you after you echo sign the deal. 80% of the revenue is after. So you're kind of a fool. If you wait to invest in the eighty percent of the customer lifetime value that's after the deal, right now, yeah. so that's easy for me and Aaron to say, right? Um, going kind of into the, the lighter capital space. Here's the thing, right? Especially if you're a first timer and you're lean, the ROI on this customer success rep is probably eight or nine months. Okay, mm -hmm. you've got to pay their salary, and then they've got to either save a deal or get an upsell, and it just doesn't happen in a week. And in fact, in the early days, in the early days. The only customers you have are those that absolutely love you because otherwise they'll just go use Salesforce or or NetSuite or whatever big vendor is already in your space. So you never the truth is you never ever have real churn in the first year. You have lots of seeming churn, but those are customers you didn't you should never have had because it was yeah. insane, right. <laughs> so, so it's a tough trade off. And so what I've learned is you need like twelve months of runway to comfortably hire a customer success team if the eight month payback is there, right? So whether it's vent, well, let's talk about financing later. Let's get to your questions. But one interesting thing about alternative things like ladder capital or even angel list or the eleventh safe note in your company, which you know the ladder is kind of kooky. But if it gets you that extra three or four months of runway, so you can hire your CSM, I would argue that's the big single biggest investment, best investment you can make when you have ten or more customers, right? So yep. get those extra couple of months of runway. Even if you got, even if you did some deal with lighter or whatever it is, you got another hundred grand into the company. Think about it for a moment. 
If you hire a CSM for hundred grand and that saves you a hundred an eighty thousand dollar customer and gets you an eighty K upgrade, ROI positive, right? Oh yeah. Yep. So find yeah. a way. But if you have three months of <laughs> runway, it's gonna seem like the most expensive hire because none of them really churn in the beginning, right? And the ones that churn you never really had, right? They were you never you never were supposed to have them, right? Well, they, they thought um, that you had some integration with SAP R3 and it doesn't, and so they <laughs> Yeah, well, you no, never really I mean, had it. it was on the website, but you never really had it. Yeah, well, that brings up another good point, though, too. Is do you see a difference with that, you guys, in companies that are selling to SMBs versus you know truly larger enterprise solutions and things like that? Because a lot of SaaS businesses we're seeing are starting to get smaller and smaller, you know, ASPs essentially, and while they there's start, there's a great scale to like single digits and, and millions of revenue. Uh, certainly harder to get up to 10 plus or 20 or 30 or 50 million um, when you're selling a $300 a year tool in a way. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, look, you, you need focus. But by the way, so the first funny thing is as much as Jason says single digit hire and I'm like, it has to be first 10 or 15. Our company has like 20 people. And we don't have one yet. But like you said, it's other things like cash flow and focus and those other things going on. We sacrifice in the uh, future. Don't. <laughs> Yeah, everyone's, but we will, you know, we will. But everyone, everyone, look, don't, ultimately you're the judge of your business, so you got to use your own damn brain and not listen to people like us when it matters. <laughs> uh, but I will say also that when, if you do have a small, like high volume small business kind of business or enterprise, the kind of person you have dedicated and what they do can vary. For sure. So this is, you know, it's like know your business. Um, it's still you need it regardless. And it's still also a bit different if you have five enterprise customers and they're all on three year contracts. It's a bit different than you have ten thousand small business customers you're paying month to month. So the more urgent, both important, one's more urgent than the other. No, oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, actually staying with the theme a little bit of uh, selling to SMBs and um, sort of you know larger larger price items and such. Um, you know, Jason, you had a good post recently on how it's really hard for companies to scale. Kind of like I was just mentioning, it's really hard for companies to scale up to 100 million in sales when you're doing you know, $300 a year and yep. such. And and I feel like we're seeing a lot more companies like that that have got a really cool little tool. It's very easy to buy, um, so I'm sure their adoption rates are reasonably high. Um, you know, don't have a ton of salespeople out there and things like that. They're able to scale up to a certain level quickly. But I really wonder about the longer term, and you probably uh, see a lot of that. You know companies doing that stuff. And I think one of the points in your blog post was, as a VC, you're hesitant to dive into companies that have such low price points. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's talk about what we know today, and then there's also the future, because everything we know today is sort of backwards looking, right? Yeah. Here's what we know today. So Vox started off all as a premium product. It's doing over 250 million revenue, and today less than 1% of its revenue is premium. <laughs> Uh, that was a strategic retreat from a market, but yeah. I'm sure they would, wouldn't mind if they got more than 1% of their revenue for free, right? 1%. So Box went from 100% premium to 1% premium in, in its de decade in business, right? Dropbox, just for some fun examples that, were, that are sort of tangible, right? Dropbox did an amazing job on premium, right? And better than anybody else in our current generation of SaaS has done. Better than Survey might be, better than, far better than Evernote, which has hit a huge ceiling with, with, the, with the freemium model. But even Dropbox today reorg their whole team to go more enterprise, right? Because they, whatever the revenues are today, 300 million from self-service, 400 million, I mean, fucking amazing company, right? But even they, they hit that, that ceiling at that point. Um, so for me, and I, at a more granular level, I just see lots of companies with small price points that hit a couple million in revenue like you are, and then the revenue decelerates to five or six percent a month, and that's not fundable for a VC, certainly. Yeah. Um, um, having said all that, let's go back in time. I mean, Adobe did it, Intuit did it, like Microsoft did it. Like some of the biggest software companies of all time were built on the back of a floppy disk or a CD-ROM that basically costs the equivalent of five bucks a month. <laughs> yeah. So to say that it's impossible is is being like a you know kind of a dumb VC on a Monday afternoon partner pitch, right? It's oh it's not possible. It's, it can't be done. It will be done. There will be another Adobe and an Intuit and a Microsoft that builds a billion dollar business at five bucks a month. Uh, but I, I haven't met that one yet. But I've met two hundred SaaS companies 
that I believe can get to 100 million on a mix of small, medium, and large customers, a mix, right? That doesn't mean being like Viva and being all enterprise. It means a heterogeneous mix of small, medium, and large. Yeah. It can all be complementary. So, yeah. uh, by the way, I think this, I'm assuming it's for a lot of the startup audience, especially in the Bay Area, there's this, this dream that's still there, which is, hey, if I build it, they'll come. If I put up this app on the, I, on the store, if I, on the web, and Google, or whatever, the exchange, play, I'm going to get a bunch of downloads, and people are going to buy my stuff, and I won't have to do any selling. Yep. And there's a lot of discomfort with the idea of, I'm, uh, I, I don't want to have to go out and like, sell people. Because, you know, I don't like, when I, when I, when I was young and uh, I got sold a used car that didn't work. And so there's a lot of uh, negative association with the idea of going out and selling. Yes. But, yeah. you know, big, so small deals can be a great way to start. Big deals are a way to drive revenue. And you look at people like, who uh, Jason introduced me to, David Ulovich of OpenDNS. And actually even Aaron Levy of Box, where they started out as engineers. You're like, I'm just going to build this cool thing. And then they get some freemium, they get some, some track for small stuff. But then at some point they decide to grow the company, they realize they need to themselves learn how to sell and build a sales team and market and grow, which includes usually going to bigger deals, bigger companies, other markets, and sort of uh, not just sit around behind your computer waiting for stuff to, to come in, but to go out and like make it happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, you know, there they go. That's what it takes to get past the small deals and small deals mindset. I'm going to wait around for stuff to come to me and just go build the company. Um, all right. Hey, let's go back to some of the, the questions on Twitter. That's a great thing to get back to it. Um, we've got one that is, uh, when should you start building an outside field sales team that are veteran field reps in, SaaS, in a SaaS environment? Um, and adding on to that, right, I, I got an MBA, and in business school they taught you this sort of stupid rule of thumb, which was, you know, if your ASP was $50,000 or more, you could do field sales and make it economical. Yeah. Um, does that really hold in, in SaaS? Well, there's, you know, the definition of field, and I'll, I want to hear Aaron's thoughts too, the definition of field sales will, will, ch will change by absolute number as you get bigger, right? So 50K may be an acceptable number for field sales in your first 18 months. And then at Box, I, I'm assuming today field sales is 500k deals and up, right? And Aaron, even maybe way back when, when you were at Salesforce, field sales was probably still trying to do seven-figure deals and up, right? Certainly, that's a definition. Now at Salesforce, it's probably nine-figure deals. But but my so, so the numbers will change. But I'll tell you my my rule: assuming you have capital in the bank, it's n equals one. As soon as you have one 50k deal, you will get another nine. You will get ten. So if capital was not a constraint and you could identify the right resource that is a mix for your crazy startup in the early days, as soon as you have one, you're sort of a fool if you don't hire your first. Now whether that's field sales means they're out literally in a remote office in New York or whether it just means it's an enterprise rep in your office that handles big deals, we could talk about the nuances. But the answer turns out is one, not ten. If you wait until you have ten of these deals, you've like wasted a year in bringing that, that expertise uh, in-house. Do you disagree, Eric? Uh, I don't disagree. Uh, I think too that there's this, this sense of because so much can be done over the you know web and phone these days, it has changed. But yeah. you, but sometimes you still got to meet with people, and so I think too there's a, there's whether well, it's a partnerships or, or sales. Yes. And once you've got some sort of there's a lot of I find there's a lot of risk in hiring if you haven't done it before. Yeah. There's a lot more risk in hiring field sales, especially if, if you sure. you have to do it yourself first, just like inside sales, right? Yeah. 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 So especially if you if you if you're a founder CEO uh, and you've helped close a big deal, or especially yeah. two, and you're saying, okay, you've got that confidence to say okay, there's more out there, and you've seen what it does, but it requires it to close it. It help you hire, like know when you need someone, and also to hire the right person. Yeah. It's a high failure, high a high risk. Uh, high risk. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't done it before. I'll just give you a fun anecdote. I invested. Last week in a company, hasn't been announced yet, a SaaS company that just really got started at the end of December and it went from zero in January to about a million two in revenue now and probably get four million this year. So great early rocket ship, Could, you know, we'll see how it goes. But first time, not first time founders, but truly first time in the enterprise, never done anything remotely like enterprise sales. And I had dinner with him last night and he's like, well, I just got back from this meeting face to face with a Fortune 500 company and they're going to pay me $400,000. But if I did it on the phone, I would have gotten thirty thousand dollars. 
<laughs> so that's a you know that's a 13x improvement by by getting on a it wasn't really a jet it was getting on an Uber right but as soon as you have that you have to do it yourself like Aaron says you have to go in and realize that 30k to 300k delta from field sales but as soon as you've closed one or two if you can find someone that works with you that isn't dilutive and you can you can rock it and understand it you're ready the next day right even though they've only been selling for five months. He's actually ready to build a field sales team tomorrow. It's just they have to institutionally understand how to do it first, to Aaron's point. Oh, yeah, it seems like we're seeing a lot more sort of hybrid where it's the real focus is more inside sales, but then they're going out and doing milk runs, and they're going to see the major customers. So instead yeah. of doing, you know, five steak dinners and every time they have to go close a sale, they're doing one or two or just visiting at the office. So it's like they put a face to things. It makes it, it, makes it a lot more real. Um, still but think it's, that they're doing still. mostly in the office. Yeah, I think that people do that often as an interim until they or yep. to find people who actually live in the locale and they know the area and there's enough concentration of business and you know, there's there's lots of ways to do it. My number one opinion advice, Aaron, I think Aaron said this in some different fashion, uh, and I might have learned it from Aaron. When you're doing this and you're you're moving from inside to outside or to figuring this stuff out, and you have some customers, my number one bit of advice in sales is get uncomfortable once you're comfortable. So first get comfortable, right? Which means do it yourself. Don't hire people to do sales until you know how it works. That's like rookie error number one, right? Yeah. But then rookie error number five might actually be figuring it out yourself, hiring those first two reps, right? Getting an engine going and staying in your comfort zone. Like I'm not gonna go do the steak dinner. I'm not gonna get on a jet and go to Topeka. I mean, man, like I, I could do so much more value staying in the office, right? And if you heard what David Ulovich, who Aaron talked about at the SAS Rand, he's like, I had to get out of my comfort zone and go do steak dinners to, to, to close seven-figure deals. And it's not just the evolution. It's get out of, once you're comfortable, then you've always got to get uncomfortable in startups, right? And, and I found a lot of founders, and I was guilty of it myself. Once you get in a groove in sales, you want to stay in the groove. Don't, yeah. right? At least spend 10 or 15% of your time getting fracked and uncomfortable in sales. Then you'll do better. Yeah. I said uh, comfort is the enemy of growth. Yeah, at least hyper growth, right? At least, ma or it's the enemy of the maximum anyway. revenue per lead. The yeah, maximum yeah. revenue, anyway. comfort is the enemy of maximum revenue per lead. This is clear, right? Yeah. Um, maybe that's a good segue a little bit to one of the questions we got, which was, I guess, specifically for Aaron, what tactics did Brendan Cassidy and team use to close deals faster when they joined Ecosci? Oh, okay. yeah, for Jason. Oh. Maybe more for me, but but Aaron can give his own version. I, I, I did write about the magic of how VP of sales can double sales in 60 days, but Aaron and I see this again and again and again, right? And I wrote a, I wrote a lot of the so-called secrets, but the real learning is there was no secret, right? The, sim the simple answer is, here, here, let me distill it all down because we can chat about the real time. You will know in 60 days if you hired a real VP of sales or not because if a real VP of sales will come in at trajectory X, and if he or she does not increase that to new X plus X percent within half to one sales cycle, they're not a VP of sales. How, whether they'll double sales, in, like in my case, in 60 days, or whether they'll increase them 15 percent from whatever track you are on. But if you don't see any improvement quickly, like uh, there is no answer. And, and it can vary case by case, right? In my case, because we had a lot of leads, it was just talking to them more and actually doing traditional sales and close. It was just having better sales IQ. And more importantly, immediately bringing in better talent because the one number one thing that every great VP of sales does in their first week is they upgrade the talent pool, right? Literally before they even understand the product, right? Um, Brendan came into Talk Desk, which will end up going one to twenty million in eighteen months, and he had a great ride there. And I don't even it, it's, it turns out to be a complicated product, but within the first week, the sales team was upgraded, <laughs> right? Sam Bond did the same thing at Zenefits. I'm not sure he understood insurance his first week there. <laughs> I understand how to sell it or how the industry works, but within two weeks, total upgrade on the sales team. That works like magic. And if you don't see that upgrade, if you don't see that 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 sort of qualitative, you've just got the wrong guy, right? Fire him tomorrow and apologize because it's your fault for hiring. Yeah, yeah. You know right away if they're really at value. Hey, I just sort of want to check. The top of my right, top right of my screen says off air, so I don't know if there's a way to check to make sure this is actually even working. Yeah, can you hear you? Yeah. Well, you can, but I don't know if the. I can see it. Subscribe. Let's let's check on the Twitter. I mean the whole. I mean, yeah, I mean the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny if it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So, uh, Where you go? You know, meanwhile. 
you know, there's some Twitter chatter and yep. we're all good. We can hear you at least. Yep. What do you got next, BJ? Um, okay. Next, next we've got, I think, a, a good question for Aaron. Thoughts on setting up a framework for integrating sales and marketing and customer success. I mean, a lot of the a lot of a lot of your book is around setting up these different groups. So maybe give the the quick one minute overview because I think if people haven't read it, it's really interesting. That and then of course you know a little bit on um, how to do sort of outbound sales 2.0 or whatever you want to call it. Sure. Um, you do because it's a it's a great piece and something that we see a lot of the companies that we're funding struggling with trying to figure out. Yeah. Well, I will say that. Uh, even though it's, it's, I still get every day or you know regularly people who come in and say, I love your book or I love this idea of specializing sales roles. Prospectors who prospect, closers who close, and of course you have like account managers, customer success, and so on. But my CEO or my executive team doesn't, they don't, they don't buy into it, they don't believe it, and so on. And you, you know, even in Silicon Valley, I think it's, it's more of a standard way to do it, but a lot of the world doesn't specialize. You know, so I think again, a lot of it comes down to make sure the, the, the management team executives understand why it's important. And to me, I don't. There's probably an example out there. I don't know what it is of a sports team that doesn't specialize to people on the team. Yeah. Or in a company, you know, engine, you get front, you know, front end, DBA, back end. Uh, in every part of a company, you specialize. But why not sales? You know, it's just a cultural. It's a legacy of how it was done for the couple, last couple hundred years. But the best. I mean, so the idea is, and there's these. Four common roles. You might have three. You might have two. You might have six. But in general, there's you know prospect. There's business development or prospectors who are doing all the outbound prospecting, or at least most of it, separate from new business closers, uh, separate from uh, you know I call it usually market response reps, or basically a junior sales role that responds to all the inbound leads. So those three, and then on the back end, like you can have, you'll have multiple types of roles of people who serve as customers, professional services, customer success. Customer support, but you do need one person who is like the, uh, con you know, at your company who is the quarterback for whatever is going on out to customers. Typically, to the customer, it sucks to be a customer and you have like three people. You're you don't know do I talk to Jim, Bob, or Jane? Yeah, I, I have seen again some companies have three roles. Like the way that ideas focus, people need to do fewer things better. So the way you implement it may be different, but to do something like outbound prospecting well. You need someone really to to do it full time. There's rare exceptions where someone can juggle and do things, but you know, really, you need someone to do it full time, to do it really well, and that's probably the number one step in order to sort of get a prospecting program off the ground, which is again what our our business helps others do. It's like we'll say, okay, when you're ready to have someone start prospecting, 80% of the time or full time, like let us know. Like that's when we can do X, Y, Z. Probably the, the main, the first step is having that dedicated person. And and the thing that people don't understand if they haven't done it is you do have to kind of model it out. And and why do you specialize? There's two reasons to spec. I mean, you specialize because you're going to grow faster. Aaron's got the same point, right? You, it doesn't make any sense. What you have to do is understand though that once you specialize and you nail it, it will pay for itself, right? Who's you're like this? You know, you're a founder first time, so you're trying to explain. It. I got to pay for all these SDRs. Like these AEs are so expensive as it is. Like those guys got to pick up the yellow pages, right? But really, you have to realize that if let's say let's say the OT for the SDRs is 80k and make up a number, raise the quote on the AE 100k or 80 80k and one dollar. It's going to work out. Uh, it will be accretive. If it's not accretive, something's something's wrong in this in this yeah. puzzle because. Because if what should happen is if you get the SDR thing nailed and it's SDRs to AEs, the AEs should be able to do more demos, take more calls, and close more, and they've got to be able to close, increase their quota, right? If it doesn't pay for itself, this specialization, something is just it's just wrong. Well, you know what happens is they'll say, I've got uh, 20 salespeople, and uh, two thirds of them aren't making quota. Yeah. But how do I how do I pay for these SDRs? Yeah. How do I pay for it? <laughs> See, your people aren't, they're all failing, so really instead of 20 salespeople, you need, you know, six prospectors and maybe ten, half as many closers, and this is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like funny how people, just the way people believe, and it's like trying to get to the point of how do you make it work, you have to have specialization, you can't grow very well, it's an, almost impossible, it's a struggle to grow without specialized sales roles. It actually turns your team into more of a, a building, like a Lego block system, it makes it a lot easier to hire, plus, one of the long, the best long-term benefit 
is, and you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you know, if you're going to relate to your bosses, now you have a farm team system, and so your sale, the way you hire and, and grow salespeople, becomes much, much more effective, and a lot less risky. So you can try to drop. I mean, lots, lots of companies have sales team churn of 30 to 40 percent per year. Yep. And it really needs to be under. I would say under 10 percent, and zero. And Jason said zero percent voluntary churn. That's a, one of the best ways to get it down low. If for those companies that are out there bootstrapping right now, I'm sure one of the things that's going through their minds though um, is, hey, I don't, I don't, I don't have VC money to go do that with. Um, what are the different alternatives? I think you know, like Jason on your blog, you mentioned, hey, I need three million bucks to build a sales team. So they're like, well, okay, I don't have three million bucks. I'm bootstrapping, or I'm making that transition from services to product, or any of those combinations of things. Um, thoughts and advice on what they do. Well, I'll get my one. So even if you're one person, you know, you can start by specializing your time. So you block something out on your calendar that it's important that you need to get to. If it's prospecting, you probably need like blocks of two hours. Uh, you know, this works for anything. For me, I block out Wednesdays to write, which you know, some often maybe works 80, 70 percent of the time. Didn't get anything done yesterday, but you, know, you got to block it on your calendar if you, you know, for the important things. So that's how you can start to do this early, even if you're one person. Yep. I mean, and so let's let's, and it, it is, a, it, you know, you you do need three million to build a team. I did the math on the on the Google spreadsheet on the blog. You can see it to to hire the VP of sales, the VP of demand gen, the AEs, the SDRs. You need, you may need more the faster you're growing, right? And it's I guess you could need a little bit less, but when you add up everyone's OTEs, that's what it's going to cost, plus or minus. But um, and, and I meant that to kind of shock people into to to thinking through the question you asked, BJ. But stating the obvious, first of all. You, it's not three million in one day, <laughs> yeah. Right? You can fund it through cash flow. You can fund it through revenue. Um, the real thing that you need to make that three million work is you need enough time, you need enough runway, right? And so if you're if you're if you're and so first of all, if you're on the bubble, right? You're doing a million in revenue or something like that, a million and a half, and you're you're not ready to raise venture capital or you hate VCs or whatever. We have a different topic for a different conversation. Um, Find some other way to get more money in the bank, right? Do something on AngelList, do some lighter capital, do some debt, get some money from your great aunt, whatever. Have the confidence to fund that, because it's your job as a CEO or founder to get that money to make the company grow faster. Like, I don't care, like, it's your problem, that's your job, and go make it happen. And whatever you do, don't do it half-assed, right? Don't hire the team lead instead of the VP, or don't ask the sales reps to do outbound from eight to 12, and then inbound from from one to five, that just never it just never works. Find a freaking way. Um, sure. But you may have to if you can't access capital and you don't have the numbers, you're going to have to hack it until you can get that three million. But know that date. Come up with a hacking plan because we're all hacking it, right? Aaron's hacking it himself right now, right? But know yeah. that date. Yeah. Say, look, on November 12, 2015, we're going to go for it, right? The business will be big enough. It grew a little small, slower than we like, but we'll be big enough. And I'm going to go get this debt or this financing from AR, or I'm going to borrow money from Uncle Linda, or whatever it is, or I'll do it from cash flow, or I'll, or I'll take a zero dollar salary like I did, right? I was venture backed, and then when the when well, there was this little like drama around Lehman Brothers, I don't know if anyone remembers today, <laughs> right? I just threw my salary into the sales kit, right? Because I knew it would pay off, and I got a little bit of equity of it, and I made like 18x on it, so it turned out to be a decent investment, but just. That's one way I threw a few extra nickels into the into the machine. Just go find a way. Stop complaining. Find a way. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I want to plan in. for it. Plan for it. You can't do it if you have six customers and you're doing five k in MRR. You can't spend three million on a sales team tomorrow unless you're a second timer and you exited for a billion last time. Then you're Josh James at Domo and they'll give you eighty million and <laughs> it doesn't matter. Here you go. Have fun. Right. So I will say because I think we're getting close on time is that yeah. um, you know related to this. Uh, I don't really hear people talk about it much, but you know, there's a reason why uh, a lot of you who are listening, including us, feel sometimes like, okay, you're you're failing, like you're struggling. You know, yep. you, it's just not working. And there's a reason why, and it's getting worse. Uh, I think a lot of it is just because if you just stop back and think about it, like when you post something on Facebook, what do you post about? If you post about when you're just having a crummy day, no, you don't because you want to like hide and eat ice cream. No, you post when you've got you won the big deal. You post when your your kid won the trophy. It's like that's the stuff you get excited about sharing. But it's it's created this reality distortion field. 
where you, all you see is everyone succeeding around you, and no. you're stuck with this, like, God, I had this fucked up day. I, it was so frustrating. Someone else, clo- I saw on, on TechCrunch, I saw Saster, someone closed a million dollar, my buddy closed a million dollar deal. My my ex-girlfriend uh, lost 30 pounds and won Miss America. Or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's it creates this false sense of you're struggling. And the reality is, yeah, of course you're going to struggle and things are going to not work, but uh, when you start to beat yourself up over yeah. unnecessarily, then you start to create, you get dispirited, I can't do this, I'm going to go search, I'm going to go watch Instagram for an hour, I'm going to spend a day on Netflix, I'm going to sort of avoid the reality versus, geez, it's just like finding a way, like, you know, you're not struggling, you're just doing what everyone else is doing, everybody's struggling together, you know, we're all figuring it out together, even today, we're all still figuring it out, Yep. so yep. just keep going. No, definitely. Actually, maybe that is, uh, we're kind of hitting time here, and on those sort of inspirational thoughts, maybe that's a good way to end it here, um, unless either one of you have any, any sort of closing thoughts, but uh, I think, Aaron, you did a good summation of what we're living, we're all living every day a bit. Um, yeah, trust Aaron. me, these days, every day, I'm like, God damn it, this is frustrating. It, to the, God, well, that'll, I think that'll change to a different kind of frustration once this, the book manuscript is done in about two months, but every day, I'm like, this sucks. I, I, this is not going to work. It will. I'll figure it out. But hey, listen. I mean, I I've been investing and uh, operating like early stage businesses my entire life, my entire career. I have never seen anything go, you know, one hundred percent up and to the right. There's That's always there's life. always fears. There's always risks. Even the ones that really do actually do a lot of up and to the right, there are a lot of sleepless nights. A lot of entrepreneurs are have when they're doing that. Yeah. People don't realize that the faster you grow, the more problems you have. Just different. <laughs> they're usually just better problems. Yeah, more growth, more problems. More money, more problems. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, listen, um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jason and Aaron. This is great. Um, I know a lot of the companies that we talk to uh, love to learn this kind of stuff and love this kind of advice and, uh, and live it every day like we're talking about. So really appreciate you guys' time, and um, I think we will then sign out now. So thanks, everyone, for who's listening in. Hopefully it was <laughs> educational for you. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, BJ. Thanks. Thanks, you guys.